Um, welcome to Johannesburg, everyone, into South Africa. Um, and um, not to mention to um, our beautiful University of Johannesburg and to the second day of the first ever uh, all team geography of philosophy workshop. Um, I'm, I'm Veli Mitsova from the philosophy department at UJ and the South African team leader. Um, and we had brilliant discussions yesterday. I would really, um, I, I very much hope that we can, we can carry on today uh, with these. Uh, let me just quickly thank uh, a couple of people and institutions. Uh, so starting with Dr. Joe Raya, who is uh, the postdoc for the South African team and is doing amazing work uh, for it, uh, as well as helping a lot with this, with this workshop. Uh, the great team at the UJ Library and ICS, uh, who are always ensuring that we're connected with the world. Um, our principal investigators, Edouard and Steve and Clark, and the teams from China, Eastern Europe, Ecuador, India, Japan, Morocco, Peru, and South Korea. Um, uh, uh, our wonderful audience, uh, which, which is making this a, a, an even more vibrant and interesting event than, than it, it would have been otherwise. Uh, uh -huh. And something that I forgot yesterday was the John Templeton Foundation, which of course has brought, uh, brought us all together and has made all of this possible. So um, without further ado, let me uh, uh, give it over, give the stage over to um, uh, the Japan uh, team leader, Yasu Deguchi from Kyoto University. Yasu, um, over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for your introduction. So let me share our slide. Um, make it presentation mode. So it's fine, all of you. So can you hear me? Well, no problem. Okay, let me start. So, so this is a report from our Japanese team. Right? So first, so this is who we are. I'm Yasuo Deguchi, somewhere here. And Kaori Karasawa, uh, University of Tokyo, has been working and serves as a core team leader of Japan. Uh, but uh, she stepped down from the core leader, but still uh, heavily involved in our project. And uh, so we have some research assistants in the both universities, Tokyo and Kyoto. We actually is a combination of two so major universities in Japan, right? Okay, so let me first briefly show the you know, our current situation of Japanese studies. So that overviews. So let me go uh, in detail very soon. Okay, so 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 here is a the situation in summary. So we completed all online studies already, and we completed campus study as well. But due to Corona pandemic, we couldn't yet complete it in person study. I think the situation is very similar to your side. So that is the overall situation in Japan. Okay, so let me go uh, study, eat study by one bang. And study one uh, that is conducted in person, so it is severely delayed so far. And we just finished, and one of those three subcategories only study one A, and one B and one C should be conducted in the future. And study three, that is online study, and we completed that fully. So that's it done. Okay, and study four, that is also in-person study. So, so we should wait for a while. And we, what we have done is just preparation. It's preparation completed study. And study six, that is online, so that is done free. Right. And study seven, that is online as well. So we, we completed that already. And study eight, that is in person, uh, experimental study. So we could finish only its preparation. Okay. 
That is, I think, the overall situation of our study, current uh, situation in Japan. So uh, based on that, so let us make two yeah, simple, rather, uh, you know, naive observations. Observations one, so I think that is one of the hot issues yesterday's first day workshop um, yesterday. And uh, so standardness with language, but good or not. So Japanese language is quite standard in our society culture. So we don't have any you know, standardness or unstandardness uh, problem for the language in use. So Japanese is simply standard language. So we don't worry about any its status at all here. A second, and our ethical committee has shown their concerns for some of the scenes in study for that maybe they said unpleasant to viewers. Scenes such as vomiting, scenes such as coiling, um, among characters appeared in the um, videos. So this issue so raises us to so leads us to the two simple open question that we want to share with you. Question one, that's that two. Uh, what is the present? Present scenes that depends on the people from one individual to another. Okay, that's good. But are there any social cultural factor for that? So maybe some of those scenes are unpleasant at least some Japanese people, but not who you are people. It's just our simple questions, right? Uh, maybe you can think about that and give us your feeling. And second, so we asked these you know, issues to our ethical committees during the corona pandemic period, June or July time this year. So that uh, makes us worry about there's some possibility that, so in the uh, corona pandemic period, our ethical committee, because more sensitive to those issues and present element of experimental material, given the, you know, their understanding about general public, uh, more or less depressive conditions nowadays. So is this uh, just our fantasy or also, or uh, the experience that you are, the phenomena that you are experiencing in your sites as well? So this is a question number two, right? Anyway, those are very simple you know, questions, observations. So let me go to the final part of our talks. So we are going to the second waves or maybe furthermore waves. So here is just suggest it's not formal, you know, uh, proposal, less than casual suggestions about how to approach the issues we are going to deal with. That is modes of knowing. So maybe the potential or possible difference in modes of knowledge or knowing. Here's our idea. This is my just philosophical observation, right or wrong. Okay, knowledge or knowing is taken to be our free action. That is an exercise of our freedom, uh, very roughly speaking. But there are many freedoms or many ideas or many versions or variants of freedom, I think, is a many corners of philosophical tradition, West and non-West, Eastern and some Asian or many other parts. So, okay, freedom in general is maybe freedom or emancipation from something, something X. That is a general generic definition or characterization of freedom. But then what is that X? What is that from which we emancipate ourselves in our free situations? And there are many possible candidates or answers to this X. One answer is that, okay, that is determination from something, a typically Western God. Or in the present day, physical law. That is quite understood as a very you know, deterministic. And I think this kind of idea of freedom is very you know, obvious in the medieval and modern and the contemporary Western philosophy, at least some corner of it. 
then what is this freedom? So this freedom is freedom as undeterminedness or anti-determinedness. I think that is a common, <clears throat> very standard Western view of freedom. But there are some other alternatives idea of freedom or X. Second alternative of X is not God or determinant, but limit or boundary of power. I think that we can find in a Buddhistic or Hinduism idea. Maybe uh, I can ask this idea to uh, our Indian colleagues. So this X is different from X number one. So this is X number two. Then freedom number two here, that is a freedom not as undeterminedness, but as unlimitedness or unboundedness, especially with power. Then here is a X number three, that is rule or regulations. Okay, so maybe we can find this kind of idea in the Chinese Taoistic tradition of philosophy. And here, freedom should mean that being detachment from rule, being free from any regulations previously determined, right? So here are three different axes accordingly, three different freedoms. So if this kind of picture is true, so that makes some difference to knowing, especially its modes. So that is our just hunch. Okay, so epistemic agencies, that should be free agent. But here we have at least three different versions of freedom. So maybe three different versions of epistemic agencies we should have. One is from a freedom as under determination, that Western idea of freedom. So this agency should be autonomous, self-determined, self-regulated one. So autonomous agency of knowing, that is very widespread idea when we are discussing about knowledge, wisdom, et cetera, et cetera. But from the freedom too, that is a freedom as unlimitedness, we can have a different idea of epistemic agent that is unlimited, unbounded, unobstacled. So maybe you can see, oh, there's no difference between one or two, but some others say, okay, there can be difference between those two ideas. And the third one from the freedom number three, freedom as a detachment from rule. So we can have a quite a different idea of agencies, free agency here that is rule free rather than rule following in the case of knowing something. In such a way, Maybe you can have a three different so epistemic agencies that is based on three different ideas of freedom, right? Then those differences in epistemic agencies should result in difference in epistemic modes, different modes of knowing, different modes of having wisdom, for example. Anyway. Is it just our you know philosophical illusion, philosophical you know mirage, or is this difference in the epistemic mode have some intuitive backup that are more or less universal or more or less specific to each cultural society? I think we think that is maybe one of the interesting points we can take into account. And when we are going further to this empirical um, cultural uh, comparative studies of epistemic ideas. So let me finish here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasu. Brilliant. Uh, it, it's great to have some philosophical background to all of this, which we, as you've noticed, we, we didn't have much of yesterday. So, so thank you for that. Um, any questions and comments for Yasu? If you can just, sorry, for those of you who weren't there, if you can either raise your hand, uh, as in raise your virtual hand, or if you don't have the facility, please type an H in the chat box, because I can't see everyone's faces. Martin's hand is up. Uh, go, go ahead, Martin. 
Thanks, David. Yes, I have uh, just uh, one small technical question. You are presenting that uh, uh, you are speaking about three versions of study one. And I would like to ask, uh, you were stating that uh, uh, study seven was, was completed already. And study seven had four subversions. Did you collect all four subversions for study seven? I'm interested because uh, I was collecting data in Ukraine. So I'm particularly mm -hmm. interested about study seven. Okay, we did that. We did collect all study seven yes. data. Yes, thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions or comments for yes, David. Hi, uh, yes, thank you very much for that. I'm, I'm curious about something because there's there's a way, certainly in in English and related languages that the the first option, the sort of uh, broadly speaking Western option, and uh, and the third one, the the freedom is undetermined. Uh, they there's there's an overlap in our language right that the, the the notion of natural law and of being regular is etymologically very deeply connected to the notion of uh, uh of regulation as uh law applying to subjects and and i wonder if if there's a similar convergence, because I was just trying to imagine ways of teasing those apart in an experiment, and I, and I realized there would be confounds partly because of of that overlap here. So I'm just interested to, to, to hear a little more about that. Okay, so let me share a comment. Okay, thank you for your question. And uh, so this is, uh, again, uh, my slide of three freedoms. Okay, and... Uh, in the three, freedom number three. So maybe I can have some quite different Western word or words for that. So in my opinion, this question, uh, freedom number three can be translated into English such as uh, flexibility, spontaneity. Uh, the, okay, uh, spontaneity is sometimes called, you know, related to the freedom and flexibility as well. But I think the flexibility or spontaneity, I think that is a more proper English counterpart or translation to the freedom number three. Right. And, but I'm not quite sure what is the English word that's appropriate to the uh, freedom number two. Right. And maybe, so, and, so, and you know, here's my uh, just rough translation of unlimitedness. Unbound, unboundedness. That is just a temporal uh, hypothetical English translation for that. Okay, so, or maybe you can tell that uh, freedom number one is undeterminedness, and freedom number two, unlimitedness, and freedom number three is a detachment from rule that can be translated or rephrased as uh, flexibility, spontaneity. That's my uh, answer. To your question. Thank you. Thanks very much. Xiaofei has uh, an H. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Professor Dekochi, uh, I have a question also about uh, the uh, the three types of freedom uh, you just uh, talked about. Um, so uh, especially related to the number three, uh, Daoism, um, now I, I don't know, uh, what, uh, why you, so, so uh, why you think, uh, Taoism, uh, emphasis, emphasizes freedom from rule. Mm, could you, uh, explain it a little bit? Um, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll explain why I think it might be more like, um, uh, uh, Buddhism, the second type of, um, maybe. Okay. Okay, yeah, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and uh, so let me say something about first backgrounds. Okay, and freedom number one, that's quite familiar to us. Undeterminedness presupposes determinant, you know, super, super strong, you know, determinant su such as a God 
or deterministic physical law. That is a Kantian fancy. And the background is that. So we don't have in the East Asian con uh, context such kind of a super, super strong determinants at all. That means we didn't have any necessity or need to make freedom first one, to produce freedom first one, because we don't have any such kind of uh, something we should against. That's the background. Right. And so the, in the Taoistic context, so there are several, you know, um, textual resources from which I draw this kind of idea, freedom number three. And one of those te textual you know, resource is uh, John Zeus, especially his idea of a prayfulness. Pray, that is the best thing we can do. Prayfulness, right, you, right. And that, what is a pray? What is a prayfulness? What is an important point about that? So my interpretation is that, okay, detachment from rule. Don't attach to a uh, rule. Don't follow, blindly or not, to rule. That is a core idea of prayfulness. That is the key concept of Taoist idea. That's why I extract this kind of freedom number three from those um, Taoistic texts. They, they think prayfulness is among the most important virtues of us. And the important point of that is being free from any rules, even though that is either autonomous or heteronomous. Confined to the rule is a bad thing to do. So can I uh, quickly add uh, uh, my uh, sort of two cents into that? So, um, uh, so I, I, I think that's, uh, that's right. Uh, but I, I also wanted to point to a particular story which uh, says a bit about uh, what John also might have in mind. Uh, so he had this very uh, famous metaphor. He dreamed himself become a butterfly. And then when he woke up, he uh, thought to himself, did I just dream to be a butterfly or a butterfly just dream to be me now? So uh, from that kind of thought, uh, he uh, concluded that um, maybe if we break out of this boundary of thinking of ourselves as a human being and extend our consciousness to <clears throat> Uh, being uh, a butterfly, then we will be truly free. Uh, uh, so uh, in that case, um, I think, uh, I don't think it is more uh, as a human made rule, maybe it, it, there's something to that. It's also a kind of a boundary imposed upon us uh, in thinking about certain ways. I, I think it might not come from human beings, it might come from habits or so uh, that's just my two cents may, may help to um, thank you, thank you. Okay. clarify this. And I agree that there are many so, possible interpretations of many texts of Dao. It's, it's not it's mm -hmm. not easy task to single down one possible interpretation. Thank you. There are the comments for you soon. I mean, perhaps I can, I can ask a quick question uh, in my non-scientific capacity as philosopher. Um, so, so how do we test? I mean, so, so like very often you hear the stuff that, that you know, in, our intuitions are just not that fine-tuned, you know? So when, when we're trying to, to test uh, amongst these three kinds of freedom, for example, how, I mean, how do you pick up differences in, a, in an experimental design of this subtle that's, kind? I mean, like, okay. It's not- that's very, Sorry. That's very important on the next question we should ask. So uh, let me imagine uh, how to approach that, uh, especially with regard to wisdom. I think this kind of a difference uh, can be direct, more direct uh, relevancy to wisdom. So wisdom, that is something we can gain, obtain autonomously, just by, our, by only by our own efforts. So we are self-contained in getting wisdom. Or in order to get wisdom, we need to be otherwise, just confine our agency to ourselves. So maybe 
we should open up our agency to something else or something like that. So this kind of idea, so maybe a question about agency, self-contained or not, or in some particular concrete context with regard to wisdom. That is my uh, possible approach to how to differentiate the people's intuition with regard to those three different possible modes of epistemology and uh, possible uh, difference in the freedoms. And the similar idea, maybe we can uh, sort of a similar idea to the more specific knowledge. Knowledge is something we can obtain only by own efforts, or it is something to come up to me from somewhere else, or both directions are essential for obtaining knowledge, something like that. That kind of a question should be relevant to the agency or modes of different modes of agency. Thanks, that actually gels quite nicely with some of the results that Eduardo was presenting yesterday. So the, the idea that, that, especially for wisdom, it seems like um, there's like a kind of very little cross-cultural variation on um, uh, people thinking that it's through their own effort and through, so agency is quite heavily involved, if I understood uh, the results correctly yesterday. Um, well, that's interesting. interesting. That's, thank you, thank you. Some other comments for you, Sue. Joe. Okay, I'm gonna go um, back to the non-philosophical stuff. Um, but you mentioned that for study for the ethics um, part was quite difficult for the videos. Mm -hmm. And I've, I find it interesting that so far I've heard very few actually saying much about study for, and that mm -hmm. you're specifically having issues with the videos. Well, I, I also, somewhat have issues with the photos. And I would expect especially perhaps this group to perhaps also have issues with this because all of the photos are white people and very um, Caucasian white people. So I, I don't know how it works for the, for the teams here, but I was quite curious to see if, if any other teams might have encountered some issues with that. Yes. Mina. Uh, we didn't have an issue with the IRB, but IRB uh, restricted the use of photos and videos uh, only to the analysis of the exact hypothesis suggested in the IRB application. For other use, they didn't allow. And, and usually, uh, it is difficult to get IRB uh, for video recording, yeah, but we, we we could take video recording. Maybe I'm also not entirely phrasing my, my question correctly. What I'm wondering is, is, is if, so if we ask, um, okay, so in South Africa, let's just break it down and say we have colored, white, black, and Indian Asian. And it's not very neat, but that's generally how we categorize categories people in the categories in South Africa. And if I show these different groups of people pictures of only white people, ethically, like to me, I'm looking at it and I'm wondering if this is not going to influence the results and if this shouldn't be something we're questioning. Even if IRB didn't do it, shouldn't we even be questioning it from like a scientific point of view ourselves? Shelfie? Well, we uh, actually have conducted all the, uh, I have finished the uh, data collection. Uh, so uh, we have students uh, actually went to the lab and completed the, uh, the survey. Um, well, I think, uh, well, some of them expressed uh, confusions uh, about the pictures, what, what, what they show. But uh, since they are all students and uh, thanks to the Hollywood movies that uh, they have been very familiar with that. <laughs> I guess they didn't find that a particularly um, puzzling part of it. Uh, but I, I, I agree with you that uh, if should we go out to test a non-student population that would present, I think, an obstacle. Um, uh, so yeah, I agree with you. 
I think perhaps this is something we can we can pick up in the discussion later on in the in the more general discussion. I mean, the two issues, the one is the descriptive one, are, are students and, and participants comfortable with this? And the other one is, is this the kind of message that we want to be sending, like the white normativity message, right? That all people are white, right? And the, the normal situation is white. So I think that that's the, the issue that, that we, we, want to, we want to perhaps uh, discuss in some detail um, later, especially for the second wave of studies. Um, great, so, so thank you so much, Yasu, uh, for, your, for your great presentation. Um, and um, we have a, a quick convenience break for five minutes, and then we come back at... Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Min Hae from our South Korean team. And today I would like to share with you the, how our Korean teams are doing. Um, and I also would like to add my suggestions for wave two. Yep. Uh, our team members uh, currently uh, Hak Jin Kim. Uh, he's a professor in uh, Korea University in Korea, and he majors in social neuroscience. And I'm actually a PhD student, but uh, I took this uh, position who manages the, all the data collection uh, of the JPP project. So I joined uh, March of last year, uh, but from that time, uh, all the questionnaire uh, arrived here and uh, my project was translating the, all the questionnaires. So I'm quite familiar with uh, all the data collection uh, work here. So yeah, we are previous postdoc left for uh, his new job or professor position. So uh, the reason why I mentioned my major social psychology is that uh, actually my perspective, uh, my experience probably with the uh, quite relevant with my uh, my major. Uh, I'm not sure, but most of you majored in uh, philosophy and anthropology and other part. It doesn't look like uh, there are many people who majored in psychology. So uh, I more, uh, I usually focus on how to collect data because uh, what we usually do is uh, uh, is collecting data, analyze data by, uh, with the statistics. So focus on quantitative data. So yeah, I would like to introduce original data flat and then how we are now. And also I would like to share how, uh, what I felt interesting during the data collection. And also I would like to share my difficulties uh, during wave one and Finally, I will add my suggestion for wave two. And so our original data collection plan was, yeah, definitely all the Korean people uh, speak Korea. So all the people are educated in the standard Korean language. Of course, there exists a uh, dialect, but it's not like a different language. So uh, also we, uh, plan to collect all the data for all the requested studies. And also uh, in the beginning when Uyol was here and he prepared this study with the uh, Japanese postdoc, it seems that at the time, probably Yuri and the Japanese postdoc planned this study and it was, uh, it had been planned to be done only in Japan, China and Korea, but in the middle, it was canceled. So yeah, only these are the study we are supposed to collect. And participants were ideally both student and non-student populations. But uh, later I will describe, there were some difficulties I had with the IRB uh, approvals. So there were too many document work I had to do. So I didn't have enough resource so I decided to focus on that student population and minimize using standard population. And right now we completed uh, data collection for all of these studies. And this month's uh, data collection for study seven is ongoing. And for study three and eight, we'll be done soon. And Study 1B and 1C, the questionnaire are supposed to uh, be composed based on the result of uh, study 1A, but uh, the 
the study leader was not prepared for the questionnaire yet uh, for some reason. And yeah, so we didn't receive the material, yet, but I, I expect that these will be done soon too. And uh, for, as I mentioned in the previous phase, I decided to focus on my students. So uh, I uh, plan to collect data for these studies for non student from non student through a survey company. And, and but these studies study one, four, eight, all of these uh, in person or study eight means two people all together. So it's not possible to use uh, uh, to hire a survey company. So I collected, I will collect data from student population for study A. Okay, here I would like to share some interesting things I found during uh, the data collection. There were things uh, during translation, I found a few sentences or <clears throat> I thought were errors, but actually they were not errors. For example, here, these are the part of the questionnaire of the study seven. There is a scenario and participants are supposed to answer these uh, questions. When I saw this car lied, car told a lie, I thought, okay, maybe the study reader made a mistake. So these are, uh, two sentences, which means the same thing. So one day I emailed their study leader. Actually, it was quite later because I was thinking, oh, this is just a mistake. And, and I, I didn't really pay attention to much. And later, oh, dear blah, blah. And oh, I found these two sentences. I think these are a mistake, are they? And, and <laughs> the answer was actually no. Uh, Terrorize, according to the uh, study reader, what I heard was terrorize means uh, it is used when people lie without knowing it was actually a lie. For example, here, Carl uh, talk about, wait, I, I forgot the content of the story, but anyway, sometimes you hear something from other people and transmit their information to the other person but actually the information was false. Then it's not that you really wanted to lie, but actually it was a lie. So when it happened, tell a lie is used. That's what I heard. Oh my God, <laughs> I couldn't really understand. <laughs> yeah, of course I could understand, but it was really unexpected, very surprised. And so, after the discussion, we reached the conclusion, Terolai will be transmitted, uh, translated as a transmitter lie. It was done in Japanese questionnaire too. That's what I heard. So we wanted to uh, uh, keep a consistency, maintain a consistency. So I, I translated told a lie as a transmitter lie in Korean. And then I added another, uh, I added another uh, dependent variable, lied without knowing that it is lied. For example, Carl told, ah, sorry, Carl lied without knowing that it was a lie. There was, we added uh, another dependent variable. So uh, what I want to say was, say is you always have to pay attention <laughs> when you translate something, yeah. And there was another case from study three, there was uh, this scenario. I don't have any background knowledge about philosophy, but it seems that it is very famous scenario in philosophy. So it is called uh, uh, the Getty case. So here, this part is the present tense, sorry, not current, the present tense. And here, this part is past tense. And I also thought these are just the simple errors. <laughs> Later I emailed and then what I heard from the study reader was actually this past tense shows that uh, the accident, the incident in this 
part, sorry, uh, this pattern shows that uh, the incident in this paragraph occurred uh, before this, before the incident in the first paragraph. That's what I heard from the uh, story reader. So I was, wow, so perplexed. And, and I asked uh, uh, many of my colleagues and just people around me, they are Koreans, of course, and they said, nobody will think this is really uh, was something intended. Every part people will just think this is uh, just an error, the grammatical error. So uh, we discussed about uh, this issue with uh, the study reader and our conclusion was just using past tense. And yeah, this is another interesting experience. I found was in 43, there are uh, can you hear me? My laptop shows the internet connection is not good. Yeah, you just broke up for a little bit. Everyone, you, didn't... You, you, you just broke up for, for a tiny bit, but you're fine. We can hear you again. Uh, okay, yeah. Yes. Okay. And uh, in uh, the GPP project is about the set of uh, understanding, wisdom, not all of us knows. So it seems that uh, it is very important to uh, properly translate the concept of understand, understanding with some diaries. And one day when I was uh, checking the final version of a Korean uh, question in study three, I found uh, the same verb understand was translated into Yehada and Yehago Itta in Korean personnel. So understand uh, doesn't have the form of easy understanding in English it, because it means just state. But in Korean, it can be uh, expressed in two forms just understand but also to emphasize uh, the current, current understanding, uh, current state of understanding. So it actually means easy understanding. So I was quite concerned with whether how I have to translate this verb because uh, in English, it's only one form, but it means both. It depends on the context probably. And sometimes in Korean language, uh, if I translate understand it as easy understand it, that's more natural, sounds natural in Korean. So yeah, there, I don't think there is a really absolute right answers here, absolutely right answers here, but yeah, I focused on uh, How natural the sentences sound. That was my, that's how I did, yeah. And also uh, in study seven, there is a word, false. So it is, I'm sorry. False is translated into kojishin, it's adjective. And, but, Later, uh, after the back translation, uh, the study leader asked me to translate false into not true because kojishin is actually included the word kojit. Kojit is included uh, into the trans Korean translation of lie. So kojima is low, known. Kojimal hada is a verb. Lai can be translated into two of these forms. And, but the purpose of study seven was uh, differentiate between the intentions, uh, intentional lie and just uh, uh, 
situation of lie and all the other things. It was about lie. So uh, the study leader didn't want me to uh, translate force into causation, which uh, includes the meaning of lie. So there was also another uh, interesting experience. So from all of these uh, experience, I thought, uh, especially for philosophical empirical studies, the translation of the concept is very important. Yeah, later I will mention that again. Again, uh, additionally, I would like to mention uh, the difficulties I had during the data collection in wave one. Uh, the biggest obstacle I had was uh, the Korean IBF system's uh, strictness. So there are too much nodes. I will mention more uh, in detail in next slide. And also there was continuous changes in the questionnaire, the original English questionnaire. It was done after translation or after IRB approvals. And also there were differences between paper versions and cortex versions. Uh, this difference, I don't mean the change of sentences, but there were differences of uh, small changes in the instruction or small changes in the randomization, something like that. Um, usually these are not a problem. I have an experience in US. I worked with the uh, uh, US systems IRB also. There uh, you, of course, I think uh, it depends on university, but uh, when I was there, I could an approval for the whole story. So you submit hypothesis and also approximate questionnaire, which you will use. After that, you are almost free, unless you uh, go over the boundaries you already submitted. But in Korea, you are not allowed to change even a single word in your questionnaire. So yeah, that becomes a problem. And also uh, for to collect uh, data from non-student population, I had to work with a survey company. We hire a survey company and I work with them and we cannot use cartridge. So I have to explain the whole randomization structure of the questionnaire to the person in the survey company and the person will make it. But when there are too much complex randomization, it's difficult to explain and, and because they are not um, they are not expert on this. They are accustomed to a simple questionnaire, but they don't have any concept of randomization or blah, blah, blah. They just know how to make it. So sometimes it was so difficult. Here I would like to uh, explain a little bit more about the IRB approval. So as I said, it's very strict. Uh, the reason why uh, it was so strict was that uh, the Korean IRB system uh, generated uh, after the big scandal in uh, bio research. So all the required ASCAL standard was on the bio research. So sometimes, you know, if you get uh, eggs from woman, definitely it needs lots of restriction. But if I asked some question, just uh, like a utilitarianism question to a person, it's not a big deal, but they apply the almost the same standard. That's why it is so strict. And so there are too much nodes. Even a single word change is not allowed though. And also if you get approval for two studies separately, you cannot combine them. You cannot uh, recruit to a participant for one study and then ask them to attend another study. It's not allowed. 
and also uh, if you want to modify the content of the questionnaire, you have to go through one full leaf cycle one more time. There is a specific deadline and there is only one someone's uh, uh, review date. So even after review, I have to change something based on their reply. And then sometimes I have to wait for another one month for next review date after I change my uh, uh, document. So what happened was, as I uh, was last year in March, I joined this project. I was requested to translate all the questionnaires and, and submit IRB application as soon as possible. That's what I did for each separate study. And then later, questionnaire changed. So I have to go modification and IRB approval again, translation again. And then later I got approval and blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly I realized there is a difference between the paper version and Qualtrics version. And then I go to uh, the submit IRB modification again, blah, blah, blah. So that's what happened. So that's why I couldn't really focus on data collection much. That's why I hire a survey company. So I didn't want to complain about this because all the people cannot know other people's situation and all, all of us uh, chose the situation based on our own understanding. So, but I would like to suggest uh, a few things for wave two. Uh, I found errors uh, several times in the original English questionnaire and also the Qualtrics questionnaire. So I would like to ask uh, hire some uh, RAs to system, uh, hire uh, RAs uh, to specialize in review the questionnaire and Qualtrics questionnaire. Of course, uh, all the study leaders uh, try to not to make um, errors in their questionnaire, but uh, some people make a mistake because, you know, your mistake is it's, uh, it's sometimes difficult to uh, see. Other people can easily find sometimes. And also uh, some people are not familiar with the Qualtrics. So maybe in University of Peace, Professor Marshall can hire some people to do that, only for that. And also, uh, if I hadn't uh, known the whole picture of the projector in last March, I would have uh, suggested a different approach to uh, PIs and Maybe I could finish all the translation first and wait uh, until finalizing the, all the questionnaire. Then only after that, I will apply for IRB, something like that. And I think everybody's situation is different and people know their situation better and they can plan better and something like that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, again, I would like to, uh, emphasize uh, the translation of the keyword is very important. So maybe study reader can emphasize those concepts and, and ask us to pay attention more to those concepts. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Any Mina. Question? Good grief, we thought we had it difficult. <laughs> uh, indeed. Um, okay, so we have six minutes for, for discussion. Uh, of this really interesting presentation. If I can just ask you, Mina, to, to unshare your screen. Uh, and then if you can, if people can put up their hand, I, I think I'll be able to see all of you on the same screen. Yeah. yeah. Okay, you can either put up your hand physically or uh, virtually. Joe? Thank you for that presentation. Um, I, I don't so much have a, a question as, as, first of all, my, my sincere sympathies with your IRB, because honestly, that sounds like a, an absolute nightmare. <laughs> I, I recognize a lot of the things you're saying with the, um, the mistakes between the, or errors that you're finding. I, I have the same experience. And, and even as a really native speaker of English, I still occasionally find sentences where, where, where I really wonder like, okay, maybe this is just the way I use English, that this is 
sounding clear to me. Like the way study seven uses the word blame, whereby I have with blame, I have the, the, the feeling that, you know, that it's something negative, but in study seven, even if something turned out positive, then we were still blaming people. And it, it felt very strange to me. So I, I really recognize what you're saying, but what I would really like to suggest actually is that we, we take your, your last point for the wave two studies and, and maybe really sit, like make a point of suggesting these to the PIs because I actually think it really would be helpful to have a bit more of a streamlined situation. And I, I especially like your, your, your second point about the big picture. Because I do think it would be nice to have some sort of standardization and an idea of, of what each study entails, et cetera. And, and, and I saw it in the earlier presentation for I think the Japanese team where, for example, they, they collected, I think it was 40 participants for study six and th that's what it says in the documents. But when I asked, I was told it was 47. And in a situation, <laughs> I, you need to keep going back. And especially if, if your IRB is the strict and you need to stick to deadlines, these seven participants, which are not in the papers, but which you do have to collect cause very big problems. So thank you. Yeah, uh yeah, thank you for uh, sharing your experience too. Yeah, that's true. I I I, I omitted to specifically mention the part. Yeah, but uh, in I don't remember exactly when, but in the middle of the wave one, uh, Edward and Victoria shared the GPP master document, wave one, the Google document. But even in that document, the order information was not perfect. So yeah, that's pre pretty important. Yeah. So we'll definitely share share with the PIs um, the request. Yeah, how would you think? Other questions? I mean, I have a quick question for you, and, and maybe this is kind of diverting the discussion. So, so if, if there are other questions, I'd have to be. So, so where you were where you were asked to translate false is not true. Um, so I, I wanted to know about. I mean, is is there a difference in Korean, right? Because obviously in English it's... Uh, usually we don't translate it into uh, not true. We just okay. say cause it, cause, cause, because usually in in philosophy question or, or in... I cannot really... You, 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 there are many questions which ask true or false. When we translate false at that time, we say kojit. Mm -hmm. So it includes the word of lie. That's how we translate usually. So actually, not true, sashiri anin, not true is not a, a typical form, but the study reader asked me to do that, to differentiate false from the concept of lie. So there aren't like three truth values, right? There aren't like true, false, and not true, right? They're just there's true on the one side, and then there's either false or not true is the same on the other side. That's sorry, I guess that's what I'm. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I I don't I don't know whether I understand your question exactly. So I just you, you say well, false is different from not true, right? The the in the middle. I'm asking whether in Korean there is a middle value, like so there's somehow there's a, some logical difference between false and not true. true. But I mean, don't worry about it. It's uh, yeah. I mean, because I mean, in, in usual thing, in in usual conversation, we don't really differentiate. But I will say, in log logically, different people can differentiate those. Okay. Okay. Great. I think that would. I mean, so maybe maybe we need to discuss it offline. But because that would, I think that would affect. Uh, uh, various conditions for knowledge that that in so, English uh, yeah, uh, are taken for granted. So so yeah, let's perhaps discuss it offline. Great, thank you so much, Mina, again. Um, for, for thank you, everyone. Um, I suggest we now decamp to the to the coffee place. I am putting in, uh, in the chat the link. All right, I think we we are ready to hear our next exciting presentation.
which is going to be given by Xiaofei Liu from, uh, from Xiamen University, um, who's going to, to present us the, the results uh, from uh, Team China. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Valley. Um, hello, everybody. Um, let me um, share my screen first. Okay, um, here he is. Um, okay, um, so uh, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, uh, the progress on uh, our side, and then uh, I'll introduce a little bit a uh, current project that we are doing, uh, which is related to uh, uh, the GPP project, but not officially part of it. And I hope this might be uh, relevant and some of you might find it uh, relevant and uh, maybe interesting. Okay, uh, so I'm the team leader. Uh, I'm an associate professor of philosophy at the uh, Xiamen University. Uh, we have, uh, in China, we have two collaborators. Uh, one is Dr. Rockwell Clancy, who is an associate professor of philosophy at the Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Also, Dr. Jin Cai Li. Uh, she is an assistant professor of linguistics uh, at Fudan University. Uh, I also have two lovely uh, TAs, uh, uh, Han Jie Yu, uh, Ri Qing Yu. Um, Okay, uh, so here is, uh, just give you uh, two pictures of uh, Xiamen University, and I hope sometime uh, in the future, uh, you might be able to pay us a visit. So here, just here, um, in this room, I have somewhere here in this room, uh, I'm here, so. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, the China team has basically completed uh, the data collection for almost all studies, except for study one. Uh, we are still waiting for the, uh, uh, the, the director of that study to uh, provide feedback on 1B and 1C. Uh, so it's currently suspended. Uh, but for all the other studies uh, where uh, data collections are leaded, uh, so we basically have done that. Uh, we had some translation errors, as uh, the South Korean team uh, did, and uh, we had to rerun uh, uh, part of study six and uh, uh, seven slash two, seven two. Um, other than that, I think we are doing fine. Uh, we are enjoying uh, luxury in I our IRB review. Uh, because uh, in China, the IRB review is um, not very strict. Uh, I, um, I have to say, <laughs> um, so that, that went very well for us. And we do have problem. We did have problems with Qualtrics um, because the internet was censored, unfortunately. Uh, so a lot of us have problems getting connected to Qualtrics uh, so that prevented some, created some problems. Um, from what we have uh, done, what, one of the biggest concerns I think I heard from our student participants was um, some of the studies were uh, too long, a little bit too long. And uh, students said that uh, after they getting to the last question, the um, probably, uh, the answers didn't quite reflect what they would uh, answer uh, were they in a better state of mind, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, <laughs> so I, I guess uh, one of the suggestions I, I would make for wave two is that maybe we could find ways to uh, shorten the surveys a little bit just to keep people focused on, on the most important questions. Um, it's just a suggestion. Uh, okay, uh, for the rest of the, uh, uh, the talk, um, I would like to go very quickly over a study that we have been doing on uh, the truth condition of um, knowledge and share some data that we, uh, we have collected about this. Uh, so the, the research we're doing is called Know and Effectivity, What the Chinese Claim to Know. Um, 
very quickly, the standard analysis of knowledge in English, in the Western uh, uh, culture, knowledge is justified true belief. So it has justification, has truth, and has belief, the three conditions. Uh, our question is, does knowledge or no in Chinese require a truth condition? So that has been a suspicion uh, from some, some of our uh, Chinese friends uh, ever since we started to uh, do epistemology uh, in English. Um, Recently, there has been a discussion on the truth conditions, uh, which was uh, rephrased as a factivity thesis, which is a linguistic thesis uh, by Alan Hazlitt. Uh, so he had a, a group of counterexamples, alleged counterexamples to the truth condition uh, that is an utterance of S knows P is true, only if P, or, uh, only if P is true. Um, one of the examples he used is also case. So every, so we, in ordinary English, we say that everyone knew that stress caused also before two Australian doctors in the early eighties proved that ulcers are actually caused by bacterial infection. So here we, uh, the, the no ordinary speakers ascribe knowledge to uh, people who lived before uh, 1980s, uh, but it is false that uh, also was caused by also. So hence counterexample. Uh, but this sort of set of counterexamples were criticized by uh, Wesley Backwater uh, in his 2018 paper he uses phenomena in linguistics called protagonist projection. Basically, uh, when a speaker uses a certain factive verb, they don't use it from their own perspective. Sometimes they use it from the protagonist perspective. Uh, so to test whether he, this protagonist projection thesis hypothesis is true, so he revised Hazlitt's example. So he showed this above sentence to his participants, and then they ask an additional question, which of the following two phrases, uh, sentences, best ex most accurately explains what is meant by everyone knew? A, everybody thought they knew, and B, everybody really knew. So uh, Aquar thinks option A is a projective answer, um, B is um, not. Uh, so if people choose A over B, it shows that what they really did uh, was they project themselves into the protagonist position and not that they think new indeed um, requires uh, tr truth. Uh, not that they denied uh, uh, to know requires P be true. Okay, um, so very quickly, I, I'll skip the philosophical details. Um, uh, we thought that there is cr critical ambiguity in the factivity thesis understood by uh, Hazlitt and uh, Bachwater. So, uh, in fact, we think there are two distinct factivity theses. One is a linguistic factivity thesis, uh, which is that an utterance of S knows P is legitimate only if the speaker believes that P is true and the philosophical factivity thesis, which is the one that Hazlitt is attacking, an utterance of S knows P is true only if P is true objectively. So um, in order to test which uh, of the factivity thesis is obeyed in everyday language, uh, in Chinese in this case, uh, Chinese Mandarin. Um, so we designed a series of cases, uh, four or five cases in particular, uh, for example, just given an example, uh, we have um, what, a car, what we call morality statement. You are the, the participants will read this uh, scenario. Your ethics professor says in class, we know that it is wrong to torture an uh, innocent baby. And then we ask three questions. The first one is, does your ethics professor really know 
that it is wrong to torture innocent baby. Uh, the question two is, do you believe that it is true that torturing an innocent baby is wrong? And the question three is, is it is wrong to torture an innocent baby true objectively? Objectively. Uh, the idea is that if uh, a participant says no to question three, uh, um, let me see, says no to question three, but says yes to question one, then it denies the uh, philosophical factivity thesis. And if the participant says no to question two, doesn't believe it, but nevertheless ascribes knowledge to uh, the protagonist, and then it deny, he denies or she denies uh, the linguistic factivity thesis. So uh, by this sort of uh, a series of cases, we want to see whether uh, linguistic factivity thesis or the philosophical factivity thesis uh, is truly obeyed in the everyday practice of Chinese or neither is or both are. Uh, so the, we use a um, seven point scale uh, like this one. Uh, so they're gonna pick what, uh, what they think most appropriate. So the, uh, here are some results. So very briefly, uh, the, so this is a percentage of people who actually answered yes by yes, I mean likely yes, probably yes, or definitely yes, positive answer to question one. And among those who answered positively to question one, uh, the blue bar shows people who violate the philosophical factivity thesis and the, the, the light blue one violating uh, the linguistic factivity thesis. Uh, as we can see um, in, almost all cases except uh, mathematical statement. This is a unique case. I'll, if we have time, I can explain that. So that's, that's a, a very special case. Um, the participants, um, the, most of them uh, disobeyed the, um, oh, I should put it this way. More people disobey the uh, philosophical factivity thesis than uh, they disobey the linguistic factivity thesis. Uh, oh, sorry, I should probably say a little bit about the demographics. So we have collected uh, about over 500 uh, answers and uh, 40, 450 of them are valid answers. Uh, roughly half male, half female, and roughly um, half of them have never studied philosophy before and half of them studied some or had a major or degree in philosophy. And 40% uh, of them are between 18 to 30. And uh, um, I think 20 or 30% of them are between 30 to 40. And then we have a few people uh, below 18 and a few people above 50. So that's a demographic. And uh, another interesting thing we find out is that we tested uh, both the noun knowledge and the verb know. And there are something, uh, some discrepancies between them. So when we ask people whether they want to say uh, it is wrong to torture an innocent human being is knowledge. And a lot, most of them, they are reluctant to say that. So the, this is the average score, uh, negative uh, there, uh, point thirty-five, and uh, there are something about future events, uh, such as, uh, do you think uh, the next Olympic game, summer o Olympic game, will be uh, held in Tokyo? Uh, things like that. Um, so those are negative uh, numbers. But when it comes to verb, no. Like, does a professor know that it is wrong to torture an innocent, innocent baby? Uh, we have a significantly more people are waiting to say, yes, that's uh, the professor knows. Uh, the future event is still a negative number, but it's much higher than this one. So it looks like where people are unwilling to 
say P is knowledge, they are willing to say S knows P. Uh, so that's, um, that's the interesting thing. And lastly, um, there's, so in the last talk, um, um, Miha talked about the uh, true and false uh, distinction in, uh, in Korean. Uh, here we have something interesting here. It looks like uh, the Chinese speakers, they are willing to say they believe something is true without believing it's true objectively. Um, so we have uh, the data here. So those, those are the data where people saying they do not believe P is true. Uh, but nevertheless, they think uh, P is true objectively. So this is our very small numbers. Uh, <laughs> odd, they still think that. Um, maybe it's, it's just uh, anomalies. And then those are the numbers where people do not think something is true objectively, but they are willing to believe that it's true. Um, so that's interesting. And it's much higher, uh, it's much greater uh, percentage. So uh, we are not sure what to make of it, uh, but it's just something I would like to share. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Xiaofei. Um, okay, um, questions and comments. I mean, maybe maybe I can I can ask you for, for clarification. The the second to last slide. Are we talking literally about um, kind of more type situations where I'm saying I believe that it's raining, but but uh, it's not raining. So uh, like, you mean you mean this one? First person, yeah. So in the first person, I'm saying in the left column, I'm saying that something is the case objectively, but I don't believe it. Are we talking about uh, that kind of thing or? or and, right, and yeah, we're talking about that sort of thing. So that's odd, very odd uh, uh, phenomena. Yeah. But the, the thing that we do not toss those out as invalid answers is because uh, during the questionnaire, we had a question explicitly asking the uh, participant, what do you, uh, how do you understand being true objectively? So we have three options, one is, um, I think it's true. Uh, two is everybody thinks it's true. And the last one is it is in fact true, no matter uh, what we think. So only those who answered, uh, choose, chose this third answer codified as um, uh, uh, valid answers. Uh, so that gives us an idea that uh, they do have an understanding of what uh, being true objectively means. Nevertheless, they still answer this way. Um, so that's odd to me, <laughs> but maybe they just forget about their, um, their, their understanding that could be true. Um, so I, I don't know what to make of it. Very, very fascinating, yeah. I've got lots of questions, but I'm, I'm going to suppress mine. So uh, <laughs> it, uh, are there other comments and, and questions? Yeah, look me. So, uh, I work on lies too, but not within the factivity framework, but within the Agrisian framework, which is of cooperative conventions and how you make um, inferences in conversation between speakers and hearers. And Agrais actually has a maxim, which is the maxim of quality. And he suggests that those can explain various instances of lying. Now, I want to look at your criteria here. And uh, for example, if you say, it's raining, I don't believe it. What are you saying there? You know, somebody, you, somebody tells you it's raining, you say, I don't believe it. But it's really talking about your previous state of knowledge and you're having to make an inference at that moment in the conversation to choose to believe a fact. And I find that kind of instance arising in conversation and being accepted as perfectly 
um, you know, um, you can you can extract the meaning by inference. However, it would not be accounted for in a factivity framework like this. So, just one, I just want to comment. Okay, thank you very much. That's uh, uh, that's 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 great. Um, it is something that we probably need to um, find a way to. Uh, um, to clarify, uh, to, to, it, it's a possibility we want to um, enumerate. Do, do you have any suggestions that we, how we might uh, proceed? Um, yes, I do have suggestions. I think we should look at, you know, there are various kinds of analyses of lying, which uh, range from linguistic analyses uh, such as, you know, yesterday we talked about evidentials uh, and how they talk, they relate to the question of truth and lying, uh, you know, your type of data. And then there are the more uh, philosophical but socially inflected theories like Grice. And then there are cultural theories of lying like bullshitting, which, um, uh, what's his name? Frank Puerta or somebody in America has talked about. I think, for example, I have papers, published papers in this area. And one suggestion I have is that we discuss these papers and also papers by Buck Walter and so on to see where there is a sort of intersection of these various theories when we are looking at data, activity data of the sort that you have brought up or my examples where I have tested for the same thing. Uh, so I'm interested also uh, personally in you know, uh, what people may consider what government calls an open flat or barefaced lie and things like metaphor and um, so on, which Grice claims to explain because he says, we know it's the case that if you say she is a hen, it's not, or she, he is a rat, it's not true, but we derive meaning from it and it's a lie, you know, it's not true, but it is perfectly meaningful. So are we after meaning or are we after classification? So those are questions I think we need to discuss. And I think the first step would be to share some readings, you know, where we can uh, hone, hone, in, hone in on your question, right? or maybe have a separate right. offline session on this, whatever. Right, so the, there are studies on the practical use of no, which, uh, for example, uh, in Chinese, we, we say, you know, that, uh, um, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm an honest person, you know, right? Um, so <laughs> expressions yeah. like that, um, so that we, 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 we did try, want to, um, um, sort of uh, exclude those sort of cases out of, the, uh, out of our study. So one way to differentiate between the kind of no, use of no that we want to investigate and the, the practical use of no uh, I just mentioned is that um, when I say, you know, I'm an honest person, I, I'm not trying to, I'm not talking about actually uh, the protagonist mental state. I'm actually talking about my mental state, the speaker's mental state, but yeah. in an ordinary way of using no, we try to describe the protagonist uh, mental state. Uh, so that's perhaps one way to, um, mm -hmm. to differentiate between those cases. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's right. I have other suggestions, but this is a longer discussion because lies are so, you know, they, they have so many different implications. Uh, and, you know, for, for in English, you would say something like, he told a lie, but the truth, so you, you, the truth mm -hmm. is a kind of monolithic concept, but lies, because there are mid, several lies, uh, is a fragmented concept. Uh, that doesn't happen in languages which don't have um, these articles like a uh, and the. And we don't have it in Hindi. So whenever we have something, like, or in many Indian languages, we say she told a lie, but we are not clear whether it's opposed to the truth or 
to a version of the truth. So these are complicated things. I don't think we can settle it now, but we could talk. Right, right. Okay. Thank you very much. Can I, can I just pursue a little bit your suggestion, Rukmini, that, that we, we, we do some more readings on these, on these issues? Um, um, I know that the South African um, Geography of Philosophy folder in, in the Dropbox has a whole bunch of readings that we found useful. Um, perhaps we can reintroduce a, a folder like this in our common international mm -hmm. uh, GPP folder, where you can, you can share some of those uh, uh, articles of yours that you were mentioning. And, and I mean, literally, let's open a, you know, on truth and lying folder, and then yes. we, can, we can just dump a whole oh, lot yeah, of that'd be great. Things that we can all find. That'd be great. Brilliant. Okay, I, I can open it, you know, after the session, so it's we can, we can start immediately. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank thank yeah. you for the suggestion. Um, we still have four minutes for 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 comments and questions. Joe. Um. Yeah. Just two things, but. First, I'd like to add on to that idea of the Dropbox, but I think in general, maybe we should try and find a way to do these kind of things more often. So to, if other teams are also interested to try and see if we can't create a bit more of a platform. So perhaps it's something we can suggest to the PIs that we make this a bit more of an interactive collaboration because we're, we're, we're collaborating as teams, but in theory, it's like, okay, the China team's there and then the Japan team's there and the South African team's here, but we don't know each other and we hardly actually talk to each other, but I think it, it's useful that we do. And, and then my, I have a question, but I, I think it's potentially a very dumb question, but I'm wondering what the purpose is of, of the word innocent in your sentence about the baby. Oh, I see. Um... Well, uh, well, I think the, uh, let me uh, just go back to the, uh, um, I think the, uh, <clears throat> the sentence was um, uh, innocent baby, all right, yeah. Uh, maybe it's a typo for me. I, I was meant to say uh, torturing an uh, innocent person. Um, <laughs> right, <laughs> torturing an innocent person, all right. Um, but I do have one of those questions, uh, torturing the baby. As so, as we had, um, sorry, uh, so we had a noun and a verb. So I think what I, what I did was to, I, I said it's wrong to torture a, a baby, and uh, is it knowledge? And but in the verb case, is uh, does the professor know it is wrong to uh, torture an innocent person? So that. That's the case. Okay. Thanks. Right. <laughs> Great. We've got one minute for a quick question. I mean, maybe I can, I can ask a very quick question. Um, hopefully. It's not a quick answer though. Uh, so, so I was wondering why, you, why I mean, so the, the Hazlitt cases are clearly counter examples to the thesis that knowledge entails truth, right? So shouldn't you be using uh, examples where the statement is clearly false, right? So he knows that uh, torturing babies for fun is cool in order to, to, to test whether, whether people can think that they, they can know falsehoods. Right, it is indeed, uh, there's a long answer to that. <laughs> um, because the, the, the challenge of creating the genuine account example in light of the possibility of protagonist projection is that uh, in order to create a alert account example, you have to have a case where you think SNSP is correct, use. And at the same time, you think P is true, is false, objectively. Um, but to avoid the, to block the protagonist objection, you have to also to block the possibility that uh, I'm objecting, uh, I'm saying, oh, it's not a genuine case of um, uh, S knows that P, because when I say somebody or I say that, I'm thinking in terms of S's 
perspective, uh, he uh, believes as knows uh, uh, p is true. So since he believes that, is he, he so he's using no yeah in 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 that way. So I think that uh, I, I use as knows p is because I think s would use that. Um, so in that case, then you have to find a way to say uh, we have no reason to think as. Uh, uh, knows P is true, but that would require us to bridge the disparity uh, we just created uh, in the original case. So that complicates the issue. So my solution <laughs> is to um, find a case where truth is unsettled. Um, and then if people then still use S knows P, then we have a case, potential case where uh, we can block the, um, uh, uh, the, the projective uh, hypothesis. That, uh, so that this complicated story. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> um, I don't know if I explained it well. <laughs> no, no, I, I definitely get the problem. Uh, yeah. Oh, but, I mean, so may maybe something more like historical, like the, the Elsa, like a parallel case with Elsa, the Elsa case would be, European people knew that burning witches for fun was true or something like that, you know, that, that burning witches was the right way to go in the middle, in the dark ages or whatever, right? Uh, because that really purged people or something like this. Like, so when, from their point of view, it was clear that that, that was the way to go, but, but anyway. And the moral case is always going to be the most difficult ones anyway. Um, right, the moral case creates, because uh, the moral case is, uh, the, the advantage of moral cases, uh, like in some cultures, uh, we do not think uh, moral, there is uh, moral statements are true objectively, uh, although we might think it is true or uh, we tend to agree with it, but uh, we do not uh, ascribe an objective truth to that. So, uh, so I guess that's, that's one of, uh, that's my point in uh, bringing up this moral case. Um, so I, I so, yeah, that's, my short answer. <laughs> great. great, thank you. Thank you so much, Hafei. Um, once again, Thanks to everybody for uh, listening. <laughs> Thanks for the questions. <laughs> so we have two minutes until our, our next session, which is going to be by Team India. Slide one, yeah. Okay. Um, Do you want me to like keep it here or stop the screen share? as soon as we are ready to begin but meanwhile if the lies people other people uh, the chinese team is it still listening to us we have one minute left yeah so do yes. we spend it in silence or can we continue the live talk we, we didn't spend it in silence and it's now spent <laughs> it's now spent <laughs> <laughs> it is well covered <laughs> <laughs> we know that it is now spent. <laughs> I <I'm> on you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Rukmini. <laughs> great. Okay, so so it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you uh, uh, Patrika Sejbal. Yeah, Ratika Sejbal. Sejbal and and Sarabi Avasti. Yes, correct. With yeah. technology. Uh, who are going to yeah. give us uh, some of the some updates on the India team? Okay. Yeah. So uh, the in, in, Indians being notoriously unable to produce a singular narrative, there are two people uh, presenting. But we thought that I would spend about two minutes, ex uh, so we could stay on that that slide, Pritika. Uh, okay. Uh, sort of, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank, not this one, but the next one. I'd like to thank Bailey and um, everybody in Johannesburg for yeah. this very stimulating um, event because we've learned so much and so many questions have come up and uh, it's, it's been really fascinating. But the second thing is that we, this thing was meant to be an update and Krithika and uh, Surabhi will definitely give you an update on the project. But 
Uh, over and above this, I pulled out two things from our data which pertain to yesterday's discussions. The first has to do with a broad macro understanding because yesterday we discussed whether if you say you're Indian, you're really making a, a, what kind of statement are you making about your knowledge of being Indian? So can big baggy concepts like knowledge, wisdom, and understanding be captured when we talk about accessing differences and variations in these concepts through, um, through, a, a re, through a nationality. And in India, that's certainly not true because we have such a variety of languages and such a um, complex um, linguistic situations and also the population is not, uh, you know, it has then huge internal migrations and it, this is a huge population which is the size of Western Europe with many linguistic groups. So if you look at that first slide, which is a fun slide, though on, the, on your left are the Indian states and on the right are the um, are many countries like Thailand, Turkey, Mexico, Egypt, and all those populations fit into the Indian population. So in some way, and Peru is there somewhere as well. So you see that there is, you know, these are the populations of many countries which would fit easily, in, mm -hmm. which match the populations of the Indian states. And of course, each of these states, uh, so if we could have the next slide, uh, each of these states is what uh, was called a linguistic state. So after in post-colonial, post, -colonial, post uh, you know, in post-colonial situations or when India became independent in 1947, the way states in India were decided was by linguistics, was the true linguistic criteria. And those linguistic criteria included the fact that if you had a script of your own, you were entitled to having a state of your own, a large state of your own. This complicated things for us because languages which were spoken by a large population, nevertheless, if they didn't have a script, did not produce a, you know, did not, uh, was not entitled to being considered a language. And we have 13 major scripts. And this is why I raised this question of whether you know, uh, nationality is also, um, uh, is not the criteria, but maybe region and uh, the types of uh, conceptual frameworks you command and the scripts you command are also markers of knowledge, wisdom, and so on and so forth in questions of community identification. So next slide. I just want one more slide, which I want to share with you, uh, Prithika or Surabhi or whoever. Yeah, so I just want to quickly end with this. Yesterday, we shared this idea of, you know, lots of um, peripheral things, multimodalities and shared jokes, regional jokes, shared histories, um, and also looking at other cultures could give us a sense of, you know, what our con conceptual apparatus is uh, with regard to knowledge, wisdom, and so on. Uh, one uh, statement that, uh, first of all, let me go to the joke. So the joke in India, which is always compared to, uh, to America, is, uh, you know, what do you call someone who speaks for only one language? And the answer is not monolingual, but it is an American. And this is a way of so this, uh, talks about you know a subliminal uh, or a, no a preconception of what India has and Americans don't have in terms of national understandings of who one is and uh, whether languages give you commands to to um, command over types of wisdom and understanding. And the second, the statement I have there was by a student of mine and it says, in my state, he said to me, he's from Northeast uh, India, and he said, in my state, we have no language. And I was horrified 
when I heard this thing, because I thought, what does he mean? And what he meant was that he did not have a script of his own. And because he did not have a script of his own, he didn't, he thought he did not have a language. And this is why um, I think this notion of whether we are using in China, one script, ideographic script, pulls together all these Hokkien, Teochew, Mandarin, and so on. In India, one script has morphed into many, many different land, and uh, has been connected with many, many different language groups. And we could go into the history, but I leave that up on the slide and we can talk about it later. I mentioned this because Pritika and the uh, Surabhi, when they are giving you their updates on mm -hmm. our project, uh, also have this background in mind. And they will be talking about two big things, as I said. One is the notion of which emerged from our demographic data, which is that um, Indians were very conflicted about whether they were Indian in the first place in the three different language groups that we had, because we had a question about what nationality are you, which should see the simple question, but was not simple. And the sec that's a big macro thing. And the second is what we found out at the qualitative level, or what they found out at the qualitative level about how people interpreted many of these vignettes. And that's very, very granular micro research. With those remarks, um, for the next 10, 15 minutes, um, um, Prithika and um, uh, uh, Surabhi will uh, okay. present update. Um, hi, everyone. So as uh, Dr. Nair pointed out that uh, we have a lot of languages in India. Uh, our constitution is 22, and uh, we have major 121 languages. Um, India has three major groups, uh, language families, uh, which is Indo four. Arab. Four, sorry, four. four. So, but uh, we have taken for the uh, project, we have taken three uh, from Indo Aryan, we've taken Hindi, Dravidian from Tamil language, and Tibeto Burman family, we have taken Maithai as a language. Um, Hindi, since it's just, it is largely spoken in India, so it's a large scale society, and Tamil and Maithai are from this small scale society. Um, Can I just on? make one intervention, uh, which okay. is that, um, you know, uh, Hindi is spoken by, let's say, it's, uh, uh, 43, 50% of the population, a uh, million, 43 million um, uh, people or more, and uh, whereas Tamil is sp spoken only by six, 7 million, about 7 million. That is not a small group but we are considering it a small group in relation to Hindi. And Mete mm -hmm. is spoken by a very small number, 0. Some, 0. 0. 0. 0.0. 0.73%. So, uh, yeah, so, so it's a very, very small, uh, you know, we, we, this large group and small group concepts are something else that we would like to discuss uh, because I think we may have had, uh, we had difficulties with it. So anyway. Let's um, um, put it up, please. So the update about the project, so the update so far is that we have completed study 11 uh, in all the three languages, Hindi, Tamil, and Mete. And uh, so far we have compiled the data of uh, study two and uh, submitted. And uh, study 1A is also completed. We are uh, in, uh, and study nine, Hindi is completed so far. We, and, uh, probably next in coming weeks, we'll be able to complete uh, some study nine with Tamil and Mede as well. And uh, work in progress is, is uh, we are working in progress with study six and study seven and study four. So uh, Professor Nair uh, would like to take up on this uh, particular yeah, so if you just go to the, you know, we, we did study one, just part one, because we didn't get the instructions for B and C. And uh, what we found is interesting is that we couldn't settle on one, and this 
problem has come up in many of the presentations. If we go to the next slide, can we go to the next slide? So this is the kind of picture we found between thought, wisdom, uh, between wisdom, understanding, and uh, uh, the knowledge. Uh, knowledge, and uh, we we are still sorting out these overlaps, and it is very difficult to, for us to get a translational equivalent of any one of these terms because they all seem to overlap. And this is something that I would like to discuss a method of decoding. So just, just to show you the confusion of the picture that we have before us from study one. So study 11, uh, study 11 Hindi was the first field work. We started off on the bigger, on the large population. And uh, for this particular study, we, we started off with doing a pilot with 20 participants to see how the study runs on Qualtrics on the, because earlier we were using smartphones, so how it runs on the smartphone. So, uh, so based on those, uh, based on those pilot survey, we, uh, we have realized that a lot of the participants were not able to answer all the questions, uh, questions uh, properly, and they used to uh, uh, non, uh, they used to leave most of the questions. So we have to impose or implement post response for the entire survey, except for the name. Name they they can absolutely uh, they should they may not uh, write the name. And then further to reach out to the pool of 160 participants of Hindi and non students. So for students, we picked up uh, students at our campus. But uh, for non student population, we uh, we went ahead with community outreach and uh, home visit. Uh, so that we can get a place to conduct the study in a group setting or one-on-one face-to-face -on -one -face setting. So during uh, this particular uh, study 11, we saw that a lot of people have uh, introspected a lot during the Y scale, where uh, they felt that it was like a breach of their privacy. And so therefore they were reluctant to share their personal issues or personal, personal thoughts. And many of the participants have been, uh, have asked because uh, because uh, we have done this study in Delhi and uh, Delhi and uh, the area area nearby. So people were more comfortable with English medium than Hindi medium. And uh, another very interesting uh, observation we found in, in the demographic data is that only 69% of participants put down Indian as a nationality. Although the question was very upfront, very straightforward, that what's your nationality? And all of them, we, uh, because we know each and every part, is, all of them were Indian. So, and rest of and rest of them said that they were Hindu, Hindustani, or Hindi. We, we will uh, ponder on this particular uh, uh, particular finding uh, in the presentation ahead. So, on this pie chart, you can see how. Hindi, uh, how uh, six, only 69% of uh, Hindi participants have uh, termed themselves Indian, although 14% of them have called themselves Hindustani, which is actually, uh, which is related to word Hindi, uh, Hindi or Hindu as a religion, but it is not related to nationality actually. And Hindi also, a lot of people have said that Hindi as a nationality, and uh, Hindu, and of course, Qatar Hindustani is one word which we can discuss in the later part. So this is some pictures from the field work uh, uh, on my left where uh, there are a couple of uh, women uh, sitting on the sofa is, is one of the group setting where we, uh, we visited one of the home and reached this community setting. And on your left, you can see there's a personal home visit where the participants were not uh, very, uh, very, um, very uh, open about doing it in the public uh, in a more group setting. So, so we went to each and every home also. So we did face to face and one on one interviews also. So uh, Rukmini ma'am is uh, have uh, have uh, been moderating the uh, had moderated the IIT students. Uh, group uh, of study 11 and uh, on my right you can see a uh, corporate organization uh, we reached uh, we have went ahead and uh, did one of the corporate organizations field work also 
to study um, in Tamil. So for Tamil uh, language, we, Pratika and I are not a native speaker of Tamil. So we hired a facilitator who was well-versed in the language in reading, speaking, and writing. Uh, she is also the one who translated the study. So it gives her a very good command when we go on the field. Um, then one of the difficulty which I would like to point out here was that uh, what happens that Dr. Nair also mentioned that sometimes English has specific words for each of the philosophical concepts. Whereas in Tamil, we found that the words, they are there, but they are more academic, which are not uh, used in spoken language. So participants were not able to understand it better since we had our facilitator with us. So she was able to explain it. Uh, but uh, later we discussed it with Edward and his team that uh, instead of literal translation, because which is not very much accessible to all the Tamil participants, we should be focusing towards the uh, nearest equivalent or something which, uh, which gives the intended meaning of what it actually means. Uh, so that participants are also not confused and which has proven to be good because now we are doing all the studies remotely. So participants are able to handle it better rather than they need somebody else's help that much. So that was there. And uh, we also did home visits and community outreach. So what happens in home visits is that, that you have to time yourself as well. Some people who are homemakers, they are available for a certain point of time. Somebody who's working, they're only available on Sundays even especially after lunch. So that is how we timed ourselves. And since Delhi is very big, Delhi has a population of 28 million. So, but we have people who have migrated from a lot of other states as well. So what happens that they also live in certain communities which are spread around Delhi. So we targeted those communities or residential societies where we found that there will be more Tamil population because we were also keeping track of the time of how long it takes us to do the survey and everything. So uh, Jampura is here near uh, IIT and uh, JNU is Jawaharlal Univers University where a lot of Tamil students are there. So we targeted those uh, areas uh, so that it was easier for us. So people kept coming in, going in. So we had a venue as well. So that is how we could uh, do this survey in Tamil language. Um, and uh, as Pratika pointed out in Hindi that how the nationality, uh, only 69% has have said Indian. Here only 53% have said that they are Indian, although everybody is Indian. I mean, it was very unexpected for us also to have such insights because we did not expect it. So when the data came in and we started translating it, then we noticed that, you know, this is something which is happening. So why is it happens uh, is that you may notice that some many people have said they are Hindian. So since Hindi is all, was spoken by only 43% uh, of the total population, but Hindi uh, is given a lot of official uh, uh, stature uh, compared to other languages. So people found that they are not included in the Indian national narrative. So they, instead of Indian, they have written Hindian. So that was very interesting, which we found in our data. Uh, we will speak about it later as well. So these were the fieldwork pictures. Uh, that's our translator, uh, facilitator Gayatri. So she did a I mean, fantastic job uh, to get the people, crowdsourced it beforehand. And it was like really organized. You see that people are coming, people are, I mean, they were sat in a distance, but she's explaining it to them since I told you that, you know, academic words were also used in, the, in our first survey. So those were a few pictures we could click there. Um, this was this happened in JNU, which is the college. So we did uh, we had had a common room. So people, so students who knew we knew, then there was some snowballing, and they kept coming in and doing the survey. So we were there to you know help them out. So study eleven Maytay was the first study we did during the very onset of pandemic, and during uh, uh, I think in April we have done study eleven Maytay. And uh, we have completely changed our way of doing the study. It was not face to face. It was a, it was absolutely remote, and uh, it would have been completed way back. But the problem with the Metei with Metei community per se is that me and Survi have reached out to a lot of Metei participants during our crowdsourcing phase, but we couldn't get access to even a single one because even after talking to them, giving a number, giving explaining them everything, forming a rapport, 
they didn't uh, they didn't allow us to uh, to de- to do a survey and then it was very strange because we tried it multiple times in multiple lo- uh, locations but it it failed like be it student be it uh, housewives nobody was allowing us to be uh, like part of part of their uh, conversation also so we again we asked a uh, asked a uh, asked a field associate who is well versed with uh, meite language and who is also a native person from meite uh, from imphal where this language is uh, uh, spoken very um, very much so she has actually helped us find the 60 participants single handedly because within their community they are well connected uh, and uh, during this particular during this particular study we noticed that they too have the nationality issue and which is again very interesting which we want to ponder uh, ahead also and lot of these people have a uh, lot of mentioned that how uh, that the survey was very very different and uh, and they have reflected on lot of their mistakes from their past so this particular community have talked a lot about their past mistakes and past experiences to the field associate so meite is actually uh, one of uh, is noted as a vulnerable language in unesco's atlas on endangered languages of 2009 so initially um, so during the pandemic it there were many challenges we, which we can discuss in the discussion but this was the first study we did during the pandemic so again even even here we can see that only uh, 8% of population have called themselves an indian and again i want to bring this up that everyone was indian and uh, 77% has called them as meite which is again a language it is not a it is not a nationality of course and then there were few very particular people have mentioned also meite brahman and hinduism not hindu not hindian but here hinduism and hindu and manipuri <laughs> so that's uh, we can discuss about this later so here we can uh, here i think i uh, professor nair would like to take up because no yeah, I, i think we leave this for discussion because we might run short of time but yeah. the chart speak for themselves 69% 53% and then only 8% so this resistance to assimilation is is a to our mind to my mind anyway uh, something that at the macro level we need to consider whether although for convenience the um uh, the investigators in you fit shows nationality actually we are seeing nationality breakdown even in the demographic data for a survey mm-hmm. of 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 this type of study and that's important because there seems to be of lots of confusions between language region and conceptual apparatus and that that's uh, something which you know I'm thinking about so I so should next. move ahead with okay. yeah we we don't uh, have much time so this so, uh, is the first okay first study 9 uh, was uh, was also done during the pandemic it was during the peak of it it was in may so 9a we did that we did around that time and the total participant for the entire study was 360 so it was a huge uh, uh number for us so uh, we had a lot of uh, we kind of ba- brainstorm because we did not want to repeat our participants from study 11 we did have their contracts so what we did was uh, prithika could you move to the second slide so what we did was uh, we used social media platforms we wrote Uh, about the project about our survey what it says what it is what its objective is about and then we posted it on facebook whatsapp and reddit we used reddit a lot and uh, because we want uh, so on reddit there are a lot of uh, subreddits if many of you may know it so it's r india is a subreddit so we posted it there then r indian academia where a lot of students are there so we posted uh, about a uh, very brief about what our project is and whosoever was interested contacted us on direct chat or something and then we did, uh, then uh, we t- uh, shared our links and everything then they told so it was snowballing they told their families they are interested in the thing it was that we needed people who were taking it seriously because we were paying them so it uh, needed to be accountable 
so that was one of the things we had to really take take in um, and uh, as we told that we ran multiple surveys now when you are on the field you can see the participants participating but when we are remote we can't see them what we did was that there were uh, we ran pilot surveys based on uh, uh, that how many how much time a fluent hindi speaker would take to to fill the survey and somebody who is not so fluent so we did an average time if it is 30 minutes so if a participant is taking 10 minutes or 15 minutes so we will not include their survey so we ended up deleting many surveys on the way uh, because it was on coltrex we were able to monitor and and we hired field associates who were trained so they were also able we were able to monitor uh, through them that who were the participants who are not so we were able to track that whom we are paying the money whom we are not paying the money so that also happened um, that's it um study 9a i just i'll just point one point because when we compare characters we notice because sometimes we were on the phone with the participants as well so what we noticed was that they were imagining somebody or they knew who's a 75 year old or they knew who who's a 25 year old in their heads and because it was pandemic situation and we had somebody as a doctor in the characters so people were giving a lot of importance to a doctor doctor can make very wise decisions doctor is the i mean you know uh, the entire situation was such and politicians in india uh, is a very common notion that politicians are corrupt so if uh, somebody is comparing characters with politician they would just they will blindly say that politicians are corrupt and uh, and whosoever will be against them so they will you know give them the higher points like that so that was one of the uh, first hand experience which we found from the participants so while doing study 9b we have uh, it it is the most recent study that we did so i'm uh, so i can share you very a lot of personal experiences but we don't have time so the one particular one is that in uh, in our lang in hindi uh, the the term behind the back is a phrase in english which have a single equivalent word in hindi called chugli which is all which is usually associated with uh, with women and stereotypically associated with women so and most of these uh, the study 9 we have done on zoom on skype on whatsapp video so the instant the most enthusiastic reactions i got was from women and how they related each of these trust betrayal story to their own story and how they got over excited with these uh, stories and they uh, they pulled in their experiences although they have written it but they have told me also and uh, that was very interesting uh, the men were uh, i mean men were interested but they were not so much enthusiastic as much as i could see the women in this case and uh, another in, in, another very uh, interesting uh, instance which i have experienced while doing this was one it participant and i have Uh, one of the participant towards the end of the survey actually said uh, after like as a feedback she gave me that i have actually went ahead and resolved one of my very prolonged issue because of this because one of my friend have talked behind the back but i never thought that there could be a third person perspective or their perspective i couldn't understand so because of this survey two of these uh, two of the participant have actually reflected on introspected on and uh, have solved their issues and there must be more but only these two have shared their feedback with me so that's very interesting so thank so, you thank you thank you very much ladies and apologies to the meta narrator whom i didn't introduce uh, it's professor <laughs> rukmini nay from uh, 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 who is the, the the team leader for india um unfortunately we, we have no time left for, for discussion perhaps we can revert to some of these issues in the bigger discussion uh, afterwards because you you've touched on uh, several issues that that have been very important and a running theme right through um so um we've got a 15 minute break now but it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Abdelatif Ben Sharifa from from Morocco who's the the Morocco team leader and he's going to yeah. give an update on the Morocco team thank thank you Veli i hope uh, everyone can hear me uh i have had uh, last year the privilege of meeting some of the people working on this project and not others 
and it's my pleasure to have got to know them this morning in particular. Uh, my name is Abd Latif Ben Sherifa, and I am the uh, coordinator of the uh, uh, project uh, in Morocco. And what I had in mind to do seems to be exactly in line of what was more or less shown this morning, giving you all an account about what the Moroccan team did so far, and maybe some openings and, uh, on ideas to be discussed or on things that need to be considered in the future. Um, sorry. Yes. Is it okay come this way? Uh, no, we're seeing your notes. So we're seeing the presenter view. You're not seeing my presentation. We're seeing the presentation, but in presenter view. So if you just go rather to the top left okay. corner of the PowerPoint, okay. and you say okay. start. Here. Oops. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe if you just press escape. Okay. Is it this? Yes. And now you have it on full screen. Okay. Well, sorry for this unexpected problem. I was saying that the Moroccan team uh, intends to give you just a broad idea of what has been achieved and maybe make some openings. Uh, one thing that I need to mention is that probably unlike uh, all other teams, there is absolutely no philosopher or something close to that in the Moroccan team. We, are actually mostly social scientists, let's say with heavy interest in cultural studies by and large, but uh, our discovery of philosophy goes back to early formative times long ago. Uh, and uh, we are associated with the project with much pleasure and we are discovering things by the same token. Uh, the Moroccan team is myself uh, as a coordinator, and we had had two um, sort of postdocs, uh, successively Yunus Fatmi and Selmet Bell right now, and a team of seven people uh, who actually have been trained ever since eight months ago, so that they can uh, get with us uh, into the research itself. Uh, I have to say that, uh, excuse me, is there a problem? It wasn't about a job for me. It was about having a life. But I guess you... Do you hear me? Yeah, you sorry. I think, that, I, I think that uh, one, of the, one of the microphones wasn't muted. Sorry, I have okay. to repeat. Okay, so um, the, uh, as I said, the encounter with the kind of problems that GOPP raises are issues that we have encountered in the very uh, empirical investigations that the Moroccan team had uh, by and large. Uh, regarding what has been done so far, well, I'm pleased to announce that since last week, we finished all the studies that were assigned to us uh, started in uh, April uh, 2019 with study uh, one and two. And two weeks ago, we cleared up the uh, study four, uh, which is was the last one. So we are done in a way as far as wave one of studies is concerned. Um, just about sharing some observations. Uh, we are a team uh, worked uh, on a face-to-face -face, uh, collection of data in all the studies. Uh, no online, no indirect or distance type of data gathering. Uh, one, it is something that was 
more or less necessary because of the overall, say, technical context surrounding us, but also because we were not confident that we will be at that level of uh, credibility of the answers, so to speak, if we were to go to another mode. Uh, just, of course, talking about our own context. Uh, one of the reasons that did actually also prompt this is that we have had um, a set of six plus one super major, um, uh, senior supervisor, uh, mostly either doctoral holders or master's degree holders, and they got a very uh, articulate training. Uh, each survey actually was done after a brainstorming of a few days in common in which we have uh, reviewed every instance before going to the data collection. So I think we are confident in the quality of what we have been gathering. Uh, we had an issue, obviously, about the way our sample would be in representative, although Uh, although, as I said, the, um, the uh, uh, agreement with the PIs was that we will rely on four or five major criteria. Uh, one is that everyone is Arabic speaking. That's our language of reference. Uh, when I say Arabic, it's Moroccan Arabic. Uh, Arabic is a, a black boss in which you may find uh, a series of uh, uh, idioms and variation, so it's Moroccan Arabic, to that it be uh, students and non-students, three, that it be different uh, social class affiliation, so to speak, uh, five, it's gender, of course, as a, as a major criteria, uh, we systematically, we systematically, we systematically um, had half of our samples, more or less males and females. And uh, finally, education atta attainment was a major criteria. Uh, the only bias in our sample, uh, as far as representation of Morocco, would be that it is mostly urban, specifically because one of the education criteria uh, couldn't ensure it would be there in rural areas. And, and two, sorry, I'm, I'm in my office, as you can see, so it's working all the time. So our bias is mostly urban. That's important because uh, you, you, you saw yesterday uh, in Mashri's presentation that there was uh, some surprise regarding uh, Morocco. And I had actually a discussion with Mashri telling him that the reason it's so close in a few things is because uh, that uh, bias specifically. Um, as I said, we have covered we have covered all the uh, uh, the uh, uh, studies now, and we're looking up for what is coming next. Uh, was one of the things that I thought we need to discuss is how can we now get associated in the overall treatment of the data that is being gathered. It's my understanding that it is uh, treated as a centralized process, which is okay, but we need to have also something in it. So we are expecting that we get some orientation on this direction. Uh, the conceptual problem, and I think it has been discussed yesterday, in particular with Clark's intervention and also uh, late evening email to the group, is 
what is it that we want to do about the box called Morocco as a representation of something? Are we talking about uh, an oriental culture as it is usually coined or Arabic culture or Islamic culture or Middle East social culture? Obviously, there are plenty of uh, ideas and views and stereotypes even. And I guess the underlying question in this GOPP project is whether uh, language, culture, history, what have you, differences may or may not impact on the way people address basic philosophical concepts. Uh, we need to know whether we can take over some explanation regarding this box. And just as uh, was mentioned yesterday, there has not been a systematic effort or intention already to draw categories between our different settings or country settings. Uh, it's one thing to say, uh, I expect no differences despite uh, geographical and environmental and cultural and historical and linguistic context, or to assume that there is, and if it's there, then what is it that makes it operating at that level? One of the tasks also is about the way we want to view uh, the data that we gathered just in not necessarily a comparative way uh, worldwide, but just in the what I call the vertical setting of Morocco itself. Uh, our intention is to start with the uh, study 6, 8, and, uh, and 11. As you may recall, study 6 is about the strict liability and moral responsibility across cultures. Uh, study uh, eight is uh, study. So, sorry, study seven is about concept of lying. This is a mistake. It's study seven, and then study eleven. It's about sound judgment and discussion and the decision making. We would like. We think that there is something here that is in the overall behavioral pool, and would like to look into it closely. And finally, there is this. Wave two uh, pro program, uh, which it is said that it's going to be mostly online based. Uh, well, uh, we at this stage do not think that we are prepared at this end to engage in online investigation, so we have to talk about it. This is pretty much it. As I said, uh, it's an overall report uh, on what the Morocco team did and where the uh, main concerns lie today. Thank you very much, Abdelatif. Okay. Um, if you could just unshare your screen. Um, okay. And then we can have this discussion. I think Petra wants to ask a question, but but we we're not going to let her. Oh my, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it's wonderful. Um, uh, questions for Abdelatif? I mean, maybe maybe I can I can ask you on what your stance is on the on the um, identity issue. So, what the the point as far as you're concerned, how you see the Moroccan uh, team? what you see the Moroccan team to be representing, to be capturing when, when you guys are doing the studies. Uh, uh, I, I, interestingly. Well, I'd rather view this in a different way. I think that uh, the overall conceptions about what uh, an oriental society is has been pretty much drawn by Western praxis in, in general terms. And I think that there is a heavy pool of views and stereotypes, which at time may not be 
properly politically correct, but they are there. It's one thing not to mention them. It's another thing to assume that they are there. Um, in 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 uh, as far as I'm concerned, to 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 give you my own view, I don't think that there is something. Uh, that I would say that there is a discontinuity, that there is no uh, homogeneity, so to speak. But again, give me what is your entry point, and then I can. I can I can have a, an appreciation. If we're talking in general terms, it's one thing. If we want to get into the details, it's something else. I see a Moroccan society, for example, to be heavily diverse uh, by virtue of uh, um, urban versus rural, by virtue of complexity of languages, uh, by standards. Uh, in regard to modernization and even by social status as well. But again, uh, I suppose that we're talking at a certain level of generalization and I would probably need to have a key entry with which to, to operate. It's not open in this way. That makes sense. Martin? First of all, I would like to thank you for your for your presentation. I was really impressed by the very careful way how you all did collect your data. That is uh, really great. Uh, I mean, face to face interviews and uh, checking and back checking all the situation. I think that we should uh, we should consider that we should think more about that because. Collecting data of the collecting data that way, and we did uh, in the most of our sites uh, as well. Collecting data this way creates the little bit uh, different social situation uh, in comparison with with online sampling, because there is a this is a banal thing and trivial thing to point out, but you know uh, if someone is uh, responding to the person in a social situation. That is probably we, we can take it for sure that the answer could be influenced by that because the people speak uh, in uh, other way to other people than in abstract sitting uh, behind the computer. So that could be somehow recorded and uh, probably some of the differences across fields uh, could be explained by that. So I suggest because that, that, that's, that's the matter of validity. I don't claim that some data are worse or better, but it is, as far as the, the validity is concerned, that is very important point. If the date, if data were collected by, in the social situations in the face-to-face -face setting, that is, uh, that could make in some, uh, in some respect, uh, a huge difference as far as validity is concerned. That, that is my point of view, and we should think about that. Um, I can only agree with what you said. I mean, I belong to a generation of uh, empiricists, and uh, as a result of that, I, I see uh, an uh, I see uh, biases that you can't even weigh by this distance type of data collection on the one hand, but also specifically in terms of, uh, let's say, Moroccan context, not to mention any other one, uh, you already are uh, biasing your sample composition because you need to have, to begin with people who are computer literate and two, that they have the means to get the equipment. And so, yes, it's possible, but with those limitations in mind, then you are, in terms of uh, power of explanation, extremely uh, reduced. Uh, that's, that's, that's the point. Um, but when we started this project, or at least as I do remember, uh, online data gathering was not put at the forefront as it is today. I can understand that in a COVID context, things become difficult, but uh, it's a point. 
Uh, Rukmini had a comment. Rukmini, if you can just unmute. I nearly told you to unmute while I was muted myself. Okay, so, so am I unmuted now? Okay. So, so I had a question about uh, this a classic notion, which is how, that you learn more from, uh, you get rich data, you get layers of meaning from face-to-face -face narrativized situations. However, what I have found with India has a young demographic. So it, you know, 65 or 70 percent of the population is below the age of 30, 35 maybe. This means, and a lot of those, that demographic is very comfortable bearing their souls, talking about taboo topics, uh, revealing what they really think without, in, in the anonymity of online space. And this is something which people trained in traditional anthropological methods, face-to-face -face understanding. And uh, I don't disagree, but there is a kind of um, two-value logic which we have here. And I would like to know what the solution is to the notion that when you have a young demographic and they're virtually telling you that we would like to talk online because this preserves certain aspects or hides certain aspects of our identity, like gender and so on. Um, I do wonder whether we should have a more complicated conversation on how different demographics behave in relation to preserving, uh, to, 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 to expressing their uh, their truths or their knowledge or their understanding. And it's not so simple to say, you know, face-to-face -face is always better. Uh, and this is what I've found in looking, in interacting with young people, that is people below the age of 20, 20 25, 30, versus people who may be in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and so on. And uh, if that worries me because I think it has an impact on the search methodology. Well, I guess this is an observation for everyone. Uh, I really think that you have a valid point here. Uh, for one thing, we are into open frontiers with this online type of data gathering. At least if we look into it from a ethnographic or anthropological perspective, uh, it's one thing to have an opinion poll on elections or on simple facts. Another thing is it's more complicated. But again, I know it's an open uh, uh, frontier. And I agree it's important to be discussed. Joe, do you want to make a comment on this? Yeah, I, I wanted to add that um, while I... I to some degree was actually under the sort of same assumptions about the face-to-face -face as, as you actually bring up. I was also quite surprised when I started exploring the online options that th there are actually groups of people that I would not have access to, strangely face-to-face, -face, whereas online I would actually have access to them. And, and not, I mean, also it, it, even in things like, okay, so South African settings for me to go into like a township, it is, quite tricky. And instead, if I actually go for an online way, we can actually very specifically target, which I had no idea was possible, but you can actually specifically target people from like a, a specific geographic area where I normally wouldn't enter. And you, you could collect data on this, which I, I think is quite fascinating. And, and the degree of precision that they can do is, is bizarre. Like, I, I don't think I would be able to find the sample without going online. Now, I'm not sure if this will always be good for this type of research, but I think in general, we, we ought to start thinking about these things more broadly because the, 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 the speed at which technology is going, we're not keeping up in terms of methodology. 
o sea. Martin? Uh, what uh, I would like to make my my point uh, crystal clear. I didn't say that uh, the online gathering of data is better or worse. What I did say that the going to the people and speaking with the, uh, with them is different. And your your send you just provide argument for that. Uh, if you are reaching people in person, if you go there, if you will go to community, that of course is risky. <laughs> of course, I completely agree. And then there is price for that. But you know, I, uh, my point was not an objection or reproach or something like that. But uh, it is during the hundred years of anthropology, the contact with the community, contact with the people face to face, using unconscious social engagement was the cornerstone of anthropology. You can uh, make it easier to use online, that is perfectly okay, but, but I, I don't uh, think that uh, it, it is worse or in, in many respects, it has its advantages, but it has its disadvantages as well. My point was that it, uh, in terms of validity, in terms of we, what, we, what we want to know, uh, notion of people living in social settings, uh, what I was uh, proposing was that online setting is specific setting every setting is specific and we should take into account this specificity that was my point not not just you know uh, evaluate uh, gathering the data worse or better or something like that but to take into account this specificity you have no risk sitting online somewhere but if you contact people, of course, it is risky and it could be dangerous. But but it is the role of anthropologists for hundred of e hundred years. You know that's uh, and and that's not promoting anthropology. Uh, my point is epistemological and not moral. And uh, in terms of epistemology and validity of data, uh, living with people engaging in participant observation uh, to create social networks, at least minimal social networks, is something as basic as any method, you know, that's, and uh, that is not to, to evaluate anything, that is just taking into account uh, this point of view, that the, if you meet people in person, that's different. And of course, even in online sphere, there are different options. Anonymous filling it questionnaire, filling in questionnaire is different thing. Then, for for example, you can speak like uh, we do right now, face to face, but in online space. And there are many, many, many ways uh, which uh, lie in between that. And uh, of course, even for anthropology and any social sciences, those options uh, should be used. But you know. Uh, in anthropology, we are trained to take into account our social perspective. Our social perspective, ways of contact, is part of the method. It is not innocent, you know. That's, and my point was that we should somehow uh, take it into account by means of, uh, you know, recording which data were collected online, which were methods of collecting, like face to face or anonymous uh, sending links and so on and so on, because it could be important. That was my point. It, not, not that it is worse or better, but it is important in terms of methodology <laughs> and epistemology. Martin, you seem to have uh, excited quite a few people. Joe, I'm gonna ask you to do some host chivalry and let the other two people ahead of you. Uh, so it's, it's Rukmini and then Surabi and then Joe. So um, uh, uh, what I'm going to say now is definitely. We don't we hear you. Got muted suddenly, Rukmini. We don't hear. Okay. Uh, so now you can hear me. So what I'm going to say now is not, I mean, I agree with the point that you can't really take moral positions on this method versus that method, as far as this sort of work is concerned. And uh, so there are different methods and we should be aware of all of them. Uh, but my uh, idea that 
field work and participant, you know, your idea that field work and participant observation are the cornerstone for 100 years of anthropology is now under quite a lot of theoretical question. So, for example, um, in, uh, in, in India, in the theory that we read, um, uh, uh, one of the theory, instances of theory we read has to do with anthropology being a colonial discipline, that people go in and that has produced orientalism and the stereotyping of self and other. So in some ways, we need to actually question that notion of participant observation where Ruth Benedict or whoever it is goes in and looks at patterns in a culture and when you replicate those studies I have done it with Darwin but you can do it with other people and what you find is that the, the, the times have changed history has moved participant observation involved a kind of way of one culture, set of cultures looking at another set of cultures. So there is a deep critique of what participant observation yielded in terms of validity. So I think that, you know, any serious discussion needs to not say this method is better or that method is better, but to also look at what you were saying yesterday, history and the circumstances of the rise of disciplines and what they tell us. This is just a comment, rather long-winded, but, uh, but I do want to put it on the table. It's provocative, I'm sorry about that. I suitably provoked, Surabi? Um, I just wanted to add uh, what Dr. Naya mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, about how younger generation is more uh, active in sharing their personal thoughts because we noticed it on the field as well that uh, many people who were elder so we actually interviewed one elder couple who was like of the age of 75 and and the soy scale you asked that if you have had any fights with somebody closer to you so they both looked at each other and said they said that we were married 50 years and we never had a fight which is quite impossible i feel um but uh, because uh, it um so when you talk to them uh, when you were on the field it doesn't uh, create a lot of, it, it is a kind of a breach of a privacy, which many participants said, but when you do it online, uh, it maintains anonymity. So that was one of the thing which I wanted to add, since we are doing uh, it online, but uh, as Joe pointed out that we really need to fine tune the methodology when we do the surveys online and that what all it pertains and what it doesn't. And it will, it will be different, but uh, fine tuning needs to be there, I feel. In, the, in this time, at least, in the corona times. Uh, this is, that was just a comment from my side. Thank you. I, we seem to have gone into the time for, for general discussion. So do we have any objections to carrying on uh, while we add it so as not to stop the impetus? Would anyone like to object? Put your hand up. Um, OK. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just carry on then. Then Joe, uh, you had a comment as well, uh, I think to Martin's uh, original point. Um, I think in part what I wanted to say has already been said, but I think also, look, I, I think largely we all agree. Like, I, I don't think we're, we're in disagreement here. I think, and I, I definitely in, in terms of like, if we're doing cross, um, well, research in different countries and we need to compare this, then obviously we're going to really have to make notes of how these different samples were actually collected because it needs to be compared. So I'm, I'm, I'm fully in agreement with you there. I just think that when you, you when we look at like the, um, the opportunities within online research, I don't think any of us actually know what they fully are. And they seem to be changing and becoming different almost by the day. But it, it's, it's also a reality that young people's reality is different and they are growing up with online and, and they are constantly on an online platform, which also means for us to understand them. And, and definitely, if you're taking the anthropological perspective here, you're going to also have to understand their online space. Exactly. That's a field. We can't really get a, around it. To, to, at some point, we're going to, in general, have to go online. At least that's my two cents worth. 
Can I say something? I think Shafi was first, and and then you can go up to the team. Uh, one thing I, I find fascinating uh, with, um, uh, oh, sorry, uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, with the, uh, the report from the Indian team is that you actually managed to uh, go to people's uh, houses and face-to-face -face talk to them, uh, which is quite unimaginable here in China in the metropolitan uh, era of China. Because um, uh, China, Chinese people here nowadays, they don't even invite friends to their houses uh, that often. Uh, very rarely, uh, my colleagues would invite me to uh, <laughs> their houses. We often, if we, we eat, we eat at a public place. Um, so, um, so that's uh, the culture. Um, it unfortunately has become, uh, has come to this point. Um, so, uh, uh, for the at least non-student populations, if we um, want to get to people's house, it would be extremely difficult and uh, would make them very uncomfortable. Uh, for students, face-to-face uh, -face, um, uh, interviews, I would I, we didn't sort of uh, do any compar comparative study, but I would imagine that students would. Uh, um, they might take the questions more seriously, uh, give a more serious, uh, uh, long thought about that. Uh, but uh, in some cases, some of the studies would make them uncomfortable. I, I, I can imagine that as well. So um, online study, uh, just the looking at their phones uh, uh, at whatever corner they are situated, uh, mm -hmm. made, gave them a, a, <laughs> some kind of uniform sort of uh, um, uniform Formally, I, 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 so that's my uh, just two cents. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Shafi. So, so then it's Abdelatif and then Liliana. Um, I, I just wanted to build on the discussion on the about the uh, online versus face to face investigation. Uh, my my idea is that we're talking about online investigation simply because now it's available uh, and, and therefore it's to be envisioned as an alternative rather than a finality per se unless we are of course on the edge of uh, getting involved in the new ways of knowledge production which uh, basically would amount to say okay for centuries this was the type of scientific investigation or activity on a face-to-face -face basis, it's obsolete, it's gone, we don't rely on it anymore, and we're moving to something else. But as an alternative, which I think it is what it is today, then there is at least a need at some point to sort of compare what results would come out of it compared to same uh, um, questions uh, to which face-to-face -face collection approach is, is, is uh, conducted. That's what I want to say. The uh, uh, sort of uh, no choice by default online investigation is a problem. Now, the, the ontological reasons to believe that it can produce knowledge, which I think it's possible, then we accept it as such, but then it rules out the perspective of comparison with another approach. The way you collect data is uh, definitely a determinant in the quality of what you're getting to. Thanks, Abdelati. I see comments in the, in the chat box. I'll ask people to, to please state them because I'm not part of the, the youngest generation that likes everything online. Uh, but I, I, Liliana's proposed um, some, uh, to, for us to put a folder on online ethnography in our Dropbox. I've already created that. So we, we do have a, a readings folder in, in, in that. Liliana, did you have any more substantive comments? Yes, actually. Um... 
I mean, uh, so just to echo, I'll echo back on it, I think if there's a uh, thinking for wave two, and just based on um, how we did wave one and all of the feedback we've just gotten, we really need to think a lot about space and place and what you know the Chinese example about going into someone's homes or not going into someone's homes. Uh, our research that was done in mostly, as I said, sort of these post-socialist, former socialist public spaces, uh, and the question about online space, right? And um, to think really, really clearly what um, is uh, what we're referring to and what kinds of spaces we're going into. And one of the things uh, I would encourage to think about in that sense is what I think uh, I got from Martin's comment about validity is also this uh, a, 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 a sense of establishing trust, right? Trust uh, your your trust with your informants, with the people that you're doing, um, that your interlocutors, right? I, I, informants is even a problematic term, right? If we if we talk about power power hierarchy, right? With your interlocutors, how are we establishing trust, our own positionality, and how that differs in these different spaces? Online, private, public is online public or private in certain cases, right? We need to really think about those things coming for wave two and also the practicality of it. Um, an issue uh, we would have would say running study eight again online is right making sure that you have these people in the same online space at the same time to do this study. So sort of thinking about the practicalities of these spaces and the limitations and uh, possibilities of all of them. So it's something to sort of put out there. And if I can just echo on Joe's comment about the need for meetings, uh, we did discuss it in the in the cafe section. If not everyone completely together, maybe just the postdocs uh, for wave two when we start doing studies, so we get a sense of communicating with each other. I wish I had the knowledge uh, that uh, I uh, I heard from people in in studies four or study eight or other studies before we did our own or sort of communicating while we were doing them rather than at the back end would have been helpful. So maybe thinking about that for uh, wave two is just sort of having this communication be more open between us. So that's it. Um, maybe, maybe I could add to that last request that there be more, uh, the, the, the postdocs are actually consulted more on uh, study design, for example. Uh, so I know from our side we've been trying to 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 push certain points that have then been ignored. But but you guys uh, are, are the people actually doing the valuable work uh, on the ground. Apologies to the to the big wigs, uh, and and it's it's you guys that we need to uh, uh, consult in the way we design these these uh, experiments and and um, in the way that we envisage running them. So, so point very well taken and I will definitely uh, recommend that. Thanks, Liliana. Are there any, Rukmini? Rukmini, yes. So this is a different, oh, sorry, I'm, am I mute, unmute? Very okay. Am I audible? You're audible. The cell, so the, so I, I wanted to make one point which is kind of related and which again came up yesterday, which is the idea that uh, knowledge or understanding is not merely uh, uh, linguistically um, sort of indexed, it's also indexed through various shared um, modalities like sight, sound, hearing, etc. And language doesn't march alone. And one of the differences between participant of observation field sites and these online sites is that you use a lot of the touchy-feely uh, oral um, conditions which you get in participant observation. They are lost in um, in online communication, and this may or may not be a good thing. I'm not talking about whether it's good or bad, but asking whether studies of, about body language, multimodality, those sorts of things could really be 
part of the investigations in this study. For example, in India, if you do this gesture, this one, it, it means I respect you. And it is immediately, it's just a gesture. You don't have to accompany it with speech, uh, but visually you are cued for recognitions of respect conventionally as well as intentionally. So in some ways, I think not looking at the accompaniments of language and the sorts of things you do when you don't have, when language is not your only probe into trust, into all these other sort of rich uh, emotional curves. We haven't discussed this. I wonder whether we should be looking, I talked about this yesterday as well, at embodied knowledge, clothing, etc., which at a glance will give you an impression of a person and skin color and all that sort of stuff. And we don't take it into account at all in these studies, but it is a difference between field sites and, uh, and uh, online sites. Um, and uh, I, just, I, I just see so many knots in this, uh, in this big nationwide project that I feel that we should, that multimodality for me is one of those um, areas which is under investigated in this project, the second wave. I don't know who conceptualizes first wave, second wave, and other kinds of wave, but um, I just want to put that into a discussion, into uh, multimodality as, as a probe into not just the identity question, but the conceptual understanding of what a wise person is, or whatever a knowledgeable person is, and so on. Thank you, um, Rukmini. Uh, we have, with this, let me, let me thank everyone for, for being here and for sticking it out to the end and for your wonderful, wonderful contributions, uh, despite the time differences and everything. Um, and please keep safe uh, and let's um, meet again soon and, and discuss, discuss these. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Barry. Bye. Bye.